So welcome to Wildlife for May. And isn't it fantastic to be able to do a wildlife out on location? And this is one, a subject that we really wanted to do and made sure we did from location. Because I've come to the beautiful River Wye and I'm in Powys in Mid Wales for a subject that we know many of you have said you want us to talk about, and that is river pollution. And of course, the River Wye has become a bit of a cool celebre the last couple of years around what's happening to our rivers across England, Wales and the UK more widely. We have seen desperate situation with pollution in what was once a beautiful, clean, crystal clear river just 20 years ago. And now, sadly, as you can see, it's really kind of pooey brown for reasons that will become obvious through this discussion tonight. We've got a lot to cover, and as ever, we're gonna try and get through as many of your questions as possible. So keep them coming in and your comments during the discussion tonight. And we've got a fantastic panel to help us through this topic. Let's go meet the panel. Yes, good evening. We've come inside now to a fantastic cafe in Glazebury, right on the banks of the River Wye for tonight's Wild Live. And we've already had so many questions from you submitted in advance, over 150 questions submitted in advance on this essential topic for discussion tonight about why our river protections are failing, why and how they're failing and what needs to be done about it. We've got a fantastic panel uh, here to discuss this tonight. We've got James Hitchcock, who's uh, Chief Executive of Radnorshire Wildlife Trust. Uh, we've got Nicola Kutcher, investigative journalist, uh, writer and filmmaker, co-produced Riverside uh, with George uh, Monbiot, who presented it, and with uh, Friends of the River, uh, Friends of the Upper Wye. We've got Sarah James, owner of an intensive poultry farm. Sarah, you've been very brave to come along tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, but I think it is fair to say you're trying to work with stakeholders to bring people together, yeah. farmers and others, to, to look at these kind of issues. And we've got, joining us from North London, we've got the uh, uh, amazing inimitable Fergal Sharkey, who uh, will, of course, needs no introduction, particularly for people like me that grew up in the 1970s and 80s for his amazing songs like Teenage Kicks and others. I have to say, Fergal, that genuinely is one of my favorite songs of all time. But <laughs> as I'm sure so many of you know, uh, in recent years has particularly become well known for his uh, phenomenal campaigning about the state of rivers in the UK as well. So what an amazing panel. But as you know with Wildlives, it's not just the panel that matters, it's you at home as well. Submitting your questions and we try and get through as many of them as possible. And also your comments as we go through and we try and share some of those as well. It is your chance to try and put questions to this panel and for us to have a brilliant discussion about these topics over the next 90 minutes. And while we'll be focusing on the River Wye, we do want to broaden out to the situation around rivers more generally as well. So let's kick off, first of all, just as a little intro. Uh, James, why are we here? And why is it that Radnorshire Wildlife Trust decided that it had to run a campaign about the state of the River Wye? Yeah. Good evening, Craig. Um, yeah, well, I think really, you know, it is a hot topic. We, as a, a vice county in the middle of Powys in mid Wales, you know, our whole area is covered by the River Wye catchment. We are an area of uplands and water. And um, the, the condition of the Wye was obvious. You know, we've been in existence since 1987. We've seen the growth of um, farming and we've seen the changes to land use practice take place. We've seen the associated deterioration in quality. We know our members and our local communities are deeply concerned about what they're seeing. And we, as a wildlife trust, like all wildlife trusts, as pragmatic activists, have a really valuable role to play in trying to channel that concern and asking the right questions to those in power that have the ability to enact change and solve this problem, because it is a solvable problem. Now, of course, the beautiful River Wye passes through uh, many counties, uh, English counties, Welsh counties, and so there are many different wildlife trusts that are engaged in this campaign and do, so trying to do something about the appalling state of the River Wye. And earlier today, I caught up with Helen Stace, Chief Executive of Herefordshire Wildlife Trust, on the banks of that river. Helen, great Hello. to see you. And what a lovely spot here yes, by the River Wye. Absolutely. Fantastic, lovely to isn't see it? you in person. Too. Really good. Yes. Great to be able to get here. Yes. And uh, really important that we're putting the spotlight on this yes, issue today. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Good. Let's have a walk down. Yeah, let's. 
That's a nice set of rapids there, isn't it? It is, yes. Yeah. Yes. And do people swim here a fair bit as well? Yes, there was a lady swimming here just a few minutes ago. Oh, right. So what has happened to the Y in that time? What, what have been the impacts on it and how has it changed the ecology here? So the first thing that happened was a lot of the floodplain meadows along the riverbanks, and it was nearly all floodplain meadow when I first arrived, all got ploughed up and taken into intensive agriculture, initially mainly for potatoes, but now maize and other crops. Uh, and the general agricultural uh, way of working just became much more intensive, so there was more diffuse agricultural pollution reaching the river. And so the river was already under stress when the intensive poultry unit started to come into the county. And that was around 2005. And since then, they've proliferated and we now have a, a very large number of intensive poultry units here. And when you say intensive, a lot of people think, yes, that means a lot more than the same area of space, which it does. But yes. ultimately, that can only be done with extra inputs, can't it? Yes, indeed. So they're all being fed with, with feed that's coming in from other countries, you know, things like soya. Um, and those all have phosphates in them and it's going through the birds and coming out in the manure and there are, each unit has up to 40,000 birds or sometimes more and there are several, sometimes several units together. So you can have one set of units with up to a million birds in it and they grow the birds over a 40 day cycle. So every 40 days they're clearing out all of the, the muck and the bedding and everything that's accumulated on the floor and that's what's then being fed into the catchment over and above what was happening under the sort of standard agricultural and management. Is it fed raw into the catchment? Uh, most of it, initially most of it was, and it was going out and it was being stored in great big heaps and you could see the heaps and sometimes they were along the river banks and we'd get seepage from those. Some of it now is going into anaerobic digesters but what that mainly does is it, it transforms the dry part of the manure into something that is crumblier and less offensive and less phosphate rich, but it concentrates the phosphate into a liquor. And that is you know, very, very intensively, a, a very intensive fertilizer. So when that leaks or reaches the river, it has a really bad effect. Now, one of the problems we've got is that the statutory agencies have had all their funding cut. So although this river should be being monitored on a six year cycle, uh, it, the main features haven't been monitored since 2010. Um, so actually, I don't, you know, the real answer to your first question is I, d I don't absolutely know because we don't have the survey information because Natural England and the Environment Agency haven't been able to collect it all. Uh, the obvious question that some might ask is, is, is this an example of the failure of designation? I mean, you, you and others would have been very proud to have uh, yeah. played that role in designating it 20 <laughs> years ago. Lots of people would have celebrated that designation, but obviously it hasn't been able to protect no. the river in the way that we would have all no, liked. No, and I think the, the real disconnect is that we've looked at it just as the river and the river channel. Right. And really you have to look at it as an entire river system. You have to think about the headwaters, the whole catchment, the floodplain. Um, and we just we just notified the channel. You know, we did argue to notify more, but we, you know, in the end, we, we just notified the channels really. Um, so you have to look at it as a, an integrated natural system, and we've got to get it back to natural functioning. And of course, this is a story with a natural England would say over half of our triple SIs in this country actually the. The threats to them come from outside, outside the triple I, yeah, yeah. triple SI rather yes, than within it. So, rather than within it. So we yeah. have to, the lesson really is, isn't it, that we have to look beyond our designated Absolutely. sites if Absolutely. we're going to put even... wildlife into recovery. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Well, Helen, thanks so much for That's joining right. us here on the banks of the River Wye today. It's such a, lovely to be it's, here. It's tragic, really, that it is murky ground rather yes. than gin clear as it was 20 yes. years ago. Yes. But, you yes. know, thank you so much for that work you did designate it with your team <laughs> yes, 20 yeah. years ago. And, of yeah. course, all the brilliant work you've done at Herefordshire Wildlife Trust to, to try and protect the wire as yes. much as possible and yeah. wildlife in Herefordshire yeah. more generally. And, yeah, we're and doing our best. <laughs> we're going to keep working now we to will try keep working and we'll turn it around again, won't we? Will. we? And we'll oh, get well, it. I hope so, yes. We'll yes. bring wildlife back. Yes. Well, thank you, Helen Stace, for meeting me up on the River Wye today. Helen Stace, Chief Executive of Herefordshire Wildlife Trust. So, James, tell us how you, Radnorshire Wildlife Trust, how are you working with other wildlife trusts across this catchment and indeed other organisations to try and sort out this mess? So, we've been working with our neighbouring wildlife trusts. Um, they've been supporting our campaign, and it's really important that, you know, all decision makers, all um, local councillors and uh, members of the centres receive letters of concern 
um, requesting that you know this this problem solved. We've also been doing some advocacy over and above that. You know, we've written to Paris County Council asking that they declare an ecological emergency to help inform their decision making and direct funding to solving and the problems on the Y. Um, we've also been closely liaising with our friends at River Action to make sure there's a coordination of message and that we're unified in our calls for change. Um, and we're looking, and we'll, you know, we'll hear from Nicola tonight about her work on the, um, the why around citizen science. Um, we've been supporting those guys, and we're looking to build um, a long-term five-year project to really um, increase that support and really make sure that we embed the work of the communities and the concerned public and get that recognised by natural resources well as and make sure that data is used to direct positive action and the solutions on the ground. Brilliant. Thank you, James. And, and you need that kind of big coalition of organisations to get involved in this because it is such a big problem. And it also it's multifaceted, isn't it? There's, uh, when James and I met up earlier today on the banks of the River Wye, James was telling me about, yes, there's a big focus, and rightly so, I think we're here tonight, about the impacts of aquaculture on the River Wye. But actually, there's many more causes for this problem as well, as James told me. James! Hi Craig, Great How you to doing? see you. Yeah, good to see you. I've been really looking forward yeah, to yeah, this, too, catching yeah, up on the banks of the River Wye. Indeed, yeah, yeah. good journey. Yeah, it was all right, yeah, yeah it was good. fine. Yeah. But this is just, uh, what a place to come. Yeah, no, beautiful day. Yeah. So James, uh, I was chatting to Helen Stace earlier, of course, yeah. uh, you'll know very well. Chief. James. Hi Craig. Great. Trust. Um, and she was telling me a lot about, obviously, the problems with the intensive poultry units, but they're not the only problems on the Wye, are they? No. Um, the modelling shows that it's agricultural practice as a whole and there's a big legacy of phosphate. People are saying that there's between 12 and 20 years worth of phosphate now in the soil. Goodness. Um, you know, there's various flow pathways, as it's described, for that to reach um, the river. So you've got a lot of land drains. Yeah. Um, you've got overland flow, so that can wash off manure directly. And that includes some sheep and cattle whose numbers are higher than they were perhaps 100 years ago. Right. Um, and you, you've then got all of the changes we're starting to see as climate changes. First challenge is here, of course, is that the Y straddles the English-Welsh border. So you've got different governments, different agencies, public bodies here, all having to get involved in this and come up with sort of joint plans about how to deal with this. Yeah, and you know, that can be a barrier. And you know, you've got different budgets, different cultures, but there is a catchment-wide nutrient management plan, and that's a start, you know. And I think the way I look at it is, it's in both sides' interests to solve this. Fundamentally, then, what do you think are the top two, three things that need to happen to, to really make a difference here on the River Wye? I think we need to see a much more robust and ambitious whole catchment plan that has some statutory targets in it, and that is well funded, but most crucially of all, pulls people together from across business, the third sector, government, and from the landowning and farming community. Because actually, when you look at the white, it's a really rural catchment, you know, for this sort of upper section, Herefordshire and Powys. And what would Probably. that plan say, do you think? It would be like reducing the impact inputs, would it? Uh, yeah. Increasing the habitat and the buffers, that kind of thing. Yeah, reducing the input, much better support in terms of monitoring um, and um, inspection because we've got the regulation there, it just needs enforced. But there are, it's probably an education piece, you know, much more regular soil testing needs to take place. If we're going to stay with a high density of intensive livestock units, manure needs to start leaving the catchment. Refocus have modelled that about 17 kilograms per hectare are applied within the Y catchment. That's wow. three times the national average. Goodness. So that legacy that's already there is just building further. Yeah, and no wonder the river's looking uh, dirty yeah. brown as opposed to crystal clear as it should be. Yeah, and all the, the slime in there. But, you know, if we tap, do the things that we need to to mitigate against climate change and tackle nature's recovery, you know, we can help with this nutrient problem as well, protect that soil from eroding. So, you know, putting in those species-rich floodplain meadows, restoring and creating new wetlands, putting integrated wetlands in the IPU and the farmyard for us, um, being much more rigorous about the way that temporary manure heaps are stored in field, 
Um, so then, bottom line, we can solve this. I think we can. You know, it's obviously going to take a lot of work and some funding, but it can be done. So there we are, hearing from James today, actually on the banks of the River Wye. And James, I have to say, you know, I found it really quite shocking to see the colour of the river today. I mean, it is, I remember hearing about the River Wye 20, 25 years ago when I first started ant conservation. It was famous for being so beautiful and so crystal clear. And I've, I've been here a few times, but I was really pretty shocked today to see what I saw. Yeah, I mean, we've seen a lot of change, especially in the last two to five years. And I think what you've got is that perfect storm of um, stresses really kicking in. So you've got the, the nutrient and then the, the phosphate problem, but then you've got the you know increasing impacts of climate change. You've got low summer flows, and then you've got storm surges. Storm surges can knock out plants like water crowfoot, and then the high nutrient status can make it really hard for them to reestablish. You know, and I think that's what's... We really want to see it, Radnish Wildlife Trust, is a move now to that solutions phase because I think a lot of the things we need to do to ensure water security, you know, restore nature and tackle climate change and mitigate against climate change, you know, also will really help against um, tackling the nutrient problem. Great. Well, James, thanks so much for encouraging us to come here today and to see this and uh, to support us with this uh, wildlife from location. It's really, really important and uh, there's a good discussion for us to have tonight. So um, I'm delighted also that tonight we're being joined by Nicola Kutcher, who's a writer, uh, investigative journalist and filmmaker. And you co-produced that amazing live documentary from the River Wye uh, just last year, wasn't it, with George Monbiot called Riverside? That's right. Yeah, Riverside was broadcast from right here as well. We were just saying that, um, yeah, we were broadcasting live from Glazebury then, and then George set off on his canoe <laughs> down river to, to explain some of these problems facing the river. And that did a really good job of raising profile and attention about this, and, and we've seen much more attention then build since as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was exciting um, to be part of Riverside because it was crowdfunded, so it, was, it, it all grew out of this growing concerns throughout the country about river pollution and it felt like it really kind of grabbed that moment and you know George was able to really highlight the agricultural pollution because sewage pollution has rightly got a lot of national attention but the why is you know predominantly an agricultural they're the main that's where the main pollution is coming from on the why so George was really passionate about you know giving it an hour of, of live tv albeit via YouTube to really make the case and lay out the problems that we're talking about tonight much more kind of candidly. And of course, it's worth saying that Riverside is obviously still on YouTube for you to watch. You can go to riverside.tv, I think it is, uh, if you want to watch it as well. Not before the end of Wildlife, of course, but you can maybe watch it straight after or on another day. But it is definitely well worth a watch. But Nicola, you've also been involved in really trying to promote citizen science here to, to understand in more detail what the problems are with the River Wye. Tell us a bit more about what that's revealed and how you've gone about it. Yeah, so it began, I'm part of, as a volunteer, I volunteer with Friends of the Upper Wye because although I'm a journalist reporting on these issues, I'm also someone that lives by the river and cares about it. So it didn't seem enough just to report on these issues. It felt like we had to do something. So I gathered with just some other local residents originally to say, well, we've, we've been told there's this ecological crisis on the Wye. What are we going to do about it? We started off, it was in lockdown. So we just met via Zoom with lots of people I'd never met before and we started researching what was going on and we quickly realised that Natural Resources Wales on the Welsh side and the Environment Agency on the English side just didn't have the data anymore. So they'd cut, because of funding cuts from government, they cut back on their monitoring points. And there was just this dearth of information. So how do you prove where the problem is if you've lost the monitoring? So we quickly realised, well, the first thing we need to do is get more monitoring going. And we've got lots of people that care about it. So we just started saying, right, let's do a citizen science project. And we learned from other citizen science projects around the country. So actually, the West Country Rivers Trust have an amazing one that's been going for years. And they gave us lots of advice. And so did, you know, Ilkley had been running one more monitoring kind of fecal bacteria and stuff in sewage in their rivers, but they were still really helpful. So anyway, we set up the citizen science project, it took a lot of work. We worked with Cardiff University, all different partners. And then amazingly, the Radnorshire Wildlife Trust and Herefordshire Wildlife Trust stepped in and said, we'll help ensure your volunteers. So we had all these hurdles. Um, and now we've currently got over 110 volunteers regularly monitoring water quality where they live, who are kind of becoming guardians for their stretch of river. And we haven't yet done all the analysis to show what all of that means. 
But what I take from it, the overwhelming message is people really care. And they care enough to go out every week and test the water and input the data. And that should send a really powerful message to our government, um, governments on Welsh and English side, to say, invest in this. We, want, we shouldn't be doing this as volunteers. There should be better statutory monitoring. And people are really willing to go and do it. But also harness, you know, harness what we've got. So the Environment Agency are now going to be integrating the citizen science data that we're collecting into their main reports. And we would like to see Natural Resources Wales do the same. And how would you summarise? What are the main findings that have come from that citizen science so far? Um, well, when there's, when there's lots of rain, you get a very turbid river. So in our kind of secchi tubes, they're like a clear tube, you see that the river water goes really brown, it's full of mud and sediment. And we're learning from the academics at Lancaster that that soil running off is often full of the nutrients that are polluting the river. So we've got a problem with soil erosion throughout the catchment. Um, and you can see that in the secchi tubes. But also, you know, we do find high phosphate readings throughout the catchment. And, and the thinking is that's one of the primary drivers of the algal blooms. But just all of my, our citizen scientists are saying they're doing this because they've seen a decline in bird life or a decline in fish life or a decline in fly life. And they're upset at seeing their local environment so degraded. And that's why they're just desperate to be part of any activity that could shed light on why this is happening and try and turn the situation around. Great. Well, Nicola, thank you very much. And thank you so much for your really important work here uh, around the River Wye. It's been absolutely crucial. So um, it's time to hear a little bit more about the science behind this, because you'll hear one word tonight, phosphates, quite a lot. And that is really this uh, overflow of nutrients into the river system. And so we thought it'd be useful to uh, speak to Professor Withers at Lancaster University to find out a little bit more about phosphates, the impact they can have on the river, how they cycle through the river system, and actually what can be done about it. So my colleague, Ali Morse, who's Water Policy Manager at the Wildlife Trust, caught up with Professor Withers on Zoom. I'm Ali Morse, Water Policy Manager for the Wildlife Trust, and I'm talking today to Professor Paul Withers. Thank you very much for joining us today, Paul. The project you've been, been leading is all about phosphorus. So why is it that nutrients like phosphate are so important in agricultural systems, but so huge damaging when it comes to our rivers? Well, uh, phosphorus is an essential nutrient for crop and animal production. I mean, it drives a lot of the biological processes which we need uh, to, you know, to grow. But the problem is that phosphorus is used very inefficiently in our food systems. Unused excess phosphorus is just accumulating in our landscape, which causes wastage and loss and leakage to our rivers. And so yeah. what are the kinds of problems that these nutrients cause when they get into our rivers and even downstream into our coastal waters? Well, rivers are really quite sensitive ecosystems. And only a small leakage of phosphorus um, can, you know, can accelerate a lot of algal growth, which is, a lot of, which is the, I suppose, the main symptom that we see from, from phosphorus leaking into rivers. And the problem with algal growth is that it smothers the natural macrophytes within the river system um, and leads to a general loss of biodiversity. Your project found, uh, when it was looking at the why, that the risk of phosphates leaching out into the river system um, comes from sort of two aspects. Partly it's the inputs from agriculture, which are sort of added year on year, but also it's the component that's already in the soil from that historic use. So we're, we're seeing quite a surplus in terms of the phosphate that's in the system. What, what kind of sort of levels, what kind of numbers are we, are we talking here? Well, in terms of the overall surplus um, for the Y catchment, um, it's about 3,000 tonnes annually that is accumulating um, in the landscape. So that's equivalent to around about 17 kilograms per hectare, um, which is a very large you know, phosphorus surplus. It's three times the national, or well, nearly three times the national average. Um, so when you combine that, that, that high annual uh, P surplus or input pressure, we call it an input pressure, um, and also the, the poorly buffered silty soils, uh, you have moderate to high rainfall, you have steep slopes. So all those factors contribute to what really is a perfect storm uh, in terms of the risk of phosphorus loss um, reaching our rivers. So 
where we do have these um, excesses of phosphate and, and we know that it's getting into the river systems, how certain are we that this is, is what's causing the sort of the, the issues that we're seeing in our, in our rivers? Agriculture is only one uh, of a multiple number of sources that are contributing phosphorus to the river. You have wastewater sources, um, you have urban runoff, um, and then you have variable amounts of retention within the river system and various levels of biological response. So it's not always easy, uh, especially at small scales, uh, to get the data to actually demonstrate a very, very strong link. And for the why, the pressure is so large um, and it's driven by manure. It's driven by livestock manure. There's 45% more phosphorus in manure than is actually required by the crops in the whole of the catchment. So that, that gives you an idea of the size of the, of the challenge that we have um, in addressing this PM per pressure. It strikes me that this, um, this sounds like a bit of a, a win-win. You know, if we can be more efficient with our use of nutrients, then there's going to be a benefit to the farm business. It's not needing to buy in so many inputs. And also we're reducing the pressures on our river system. So if that's the case, if it's so beneficial on both fronts, then, then why aren't we doing this already? What are the barriers that we're facing here? We're talking about fundamental system change here. So if we're going to address the manure P loading in the Y, just to get to P balance within the catchment, we calculated that you would have to reduce fertilizer inputs by 75%. We're doing the small things, the things that we know we can do without impacting profitability of the farm. What's needed now, I think, is so it's not just the farmer who is responsible, it's industry, it's the public, you know, all stakeholders have got a vested interest in addressing this problem. There we go. Very good to hear from Professor Withers about that. And thank you, uh, my colleague Ali Morse, for talking to Professor Withers about phosphates. We've got lots of questions and comments coming in. Thank you very much. Just some live comments. Uh, David has said, big up for By the River, Glazebury. David, you know exactly where we are, this lovely cafe by the river in Glazebury. So someone spotted that. Michael has said, shout out to the River Tees. I'll give you that because I was up at the River Tees just a week or so back. So I'll give you that. And this, uh, much as we're focusing on the River Wire tonight, these issues are relevant to so many rivers across the country. Um, and also, um, we have Christine uh, Hugh-Jones who said, all these citizen science groups in the Y catchment are coming together. We need top expert support from freshwater ecologists, please. So, you know, a big shout out for citizen science as well there. And uh, lots of questions coming in, but we'll come to those in just a moment. First of all, what I want to do is come to Sarah James, who I said is an intensive poultry farmer in Wales here, who's been farming in partnership with her husband on a small upland poultry farm in the heart of Mid Wales for many years, and has also carried out a solo farming connect management exchange study in 2019 on the utilization of poultry manure across Europe. Sounds lovely, doesn't it? Anyway, um, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, with Wild Lives, we always like to try and really explore the debate from lots of different sides of the equation, and I think it's Brave for you to come on tonight. We're really grateful that you have to help us try and understand things. Tell us, uh, tell us first of all a little bit about your farm. Um, well, we were a very small farm, beef and sheep. Um, my husband and myself worked out, so we had to diversify to keep the farm um, for the next generation for our two little ones. So poultry was a very available for bank funding, so they were very interested. The growth um, in the industry meant that we could pay the money back. So we diversified, um, and we're on our fourth flock now, um, so relatively new in the grand scheme of things. But um, I was really concerned about the manure because we're only a small farm and I knew it was going to be an issue moving forward. So I had a mentor from Farming Connect to help advise and I wasn't exactly happy with the answers I got from that. So I did my own study tour to look at what else could be done for the utilisation of that, that sort of, I don't want to call it a waste product because it's a fantastically valuable product. But yeah, I had to look into what we could do with it. And what did that study show? Uh, it's very expensive, <laughs> any solution, and it's groups of solutions rather than just one silver bullet. There is no solution that's going to be right for everybody. 
there's a huge difference in the actual product um, that you're classing as the waste product between broilers and free range. Um, and I can only comment on what we can do with free range. But um, we're not reinventing the wheel. These solutions are out there. I've seen them. They are fantastic for green energy production. It's got a huge calorie value. So it's actually a really, really great product to be burning to produce electric. Um, so I think there needs to be bigger conversations, not just with NRW, but with actual government, Welsh government level, about how the infrastructure is put in to Powys to utilise that product as an asset to green energy rather than it just being a problem in the river, because they, they are there, it's doable. Great. And so where, are, where has this been deployed? You said you've seen it. Um, where have you seen it? So I visited a major power plant in Mordrick, which is about an hour and a half below Amsterdam. They actually started as one farmer in a similar situation because it's a very different um, landscape over there. They're already phosphate loaded with their ground from, their poultry, from the pig industry and the dairy industry. So when they wanted to diversify into poultry, they were, they were actually told at the very beginning of that industry that none of it could be spread on the land. They had to export it all out. So they were already thinking before the industry even started that there was going to be a problem and they had to find solutions. So it's a power plant. It was a group of eight farmers that got together and said, how can we fix this? How can we utilize it? Because it's a very expensive product to actually transport because of the, the moisture contents. You're, you don't want to be transporting water around the place. So they set up a power plant. It cost them 153 million euros. They had a great tariff from the government on a 12-year deal. They paid, the back, paid that 153 million back in eight years on the electric that they produced. And they were just about to sign up for another 12-year tariff deal with the companies that do the, the government companies that do the feedback in. So it's possible. They're there. And they actually came to the UK to see these things. And it's built off um, an example that actually is manufactured in Northern Ireland. So really? It, How it, extraordinary. It's not that far from home. We need to start opening our eyes. How extraordinary. So tell us a little bit more about the change uh, to farming that's happened here in the sort of why catchment over the last 20, 30 years, because it, it didn't used to be intensive poultry here. What, why is it we've seen this explosion of kind of poultry, uh, intensive poultry units uh, across the river why catchment over the last, what, what is it, 20 years mostly? Yeah, well, I think in, you've got to remember that 70, 80 years ago, we were still using horses and things. Tractors are relatively new. So the industry itself has exploded um, in all technologies across all sectors. So this is just one element that actually that Powys farmers, who are predominantly beef and sheep hill farmers, were able to utilise as a diversification to add another string to their bow for income to survive what's coming and, and how land prices and things have gone up. So you've got to have that income. It's a huge investment. Um, but I think it was an opportunity that actually boomed after foot and mouth. A lot of people lost their entire livestock of both sheep and beef. And this was a way of diversifying quite quickly to get back into production because livestock is such a long-term process. You know, bloodlines and breeding lines were lost and it takes years to get those back. So I think it boomed after that and the growth in the industry is huge. But it's not just from the need of a farmer wanting a diversification to, to make a living. It's actually driven by the consumer wanting a product. We would never be able to produce a product that the consumer wasn't going to buy or want it because that's not financially viable. It's not even financially viable to do one that they do want. So I think like we're already, we're still importing 2 billion eggs a year into this country. So there is a demand for that product. So it's not like we're just making this up because we fancy having some chicken. So I think it's it, a consumer's driving the marketplace for the farmers to diversify. So I'm not saying don't stop eating eggs because that would be disastrous. But I think there's a balance in actually having a grown-up conversation with people above NRW, with Welsh government, to look at the solutions for infrastructure and investment into this product utilisation, because it's a huge asset that could be... It's being wasted at the moment, and it's ending up in the wrong place. And I think that's where the problem is. And I should say, Natural Resource Wales is... NRW is Natural Resource mm -hmm. Wales, the, the Welsh government uh, environment agency yeah. here, just to sort of explain that. And really, final question, opening question at least, Sarah, uh, for me is, you know, many people might say, well, why is it you're looking for, for government to help in, in the sort of investments or support to, to stop this manure-going rivers? I mean, some people would say, why, why don't... You know, surely it should be farmers' responsibility to stop, stop this going into the river in the first place. Yeah, I would half agree with that comment, um, but one tree a forest does not make. And I think that you need to look at it from an industry point of view. This whole supply chain should be responsible for this because they're driving the need for the product. 
an individual's farmer's capability to invest enough money to, you to, to, to make the product safe, if you like, um, is over and above and beyond what it is financially viable to do on farm. I will tell you that this week we've had some bad news at home. Our current flock will actually have a loss of £30,000 this year, which is hugely worrying with the increase in costs for feed and electric. We'll be empty for longer than we normally would be. So that financial pressure now coming on to our family business and how we actually pay our own house bills is a real concern. So the level of investment needed needs to be higher up the chain. It needs to be a cooperative approach across all industry involvement. The supply chain needs to become responsible for the whole thing. It should not be pushed back on to an individual farmer to deal with that product because it's driven by the whole industry from supermarket through the supply chain. Okay, Sarah, thank you very much for sort of setting up that conversation uh, for us tonight. Well, we had so many people wanted to be involved in this discussion tonight, and one of them was Yolo Williams, uh, the uh, wildlife presenter and also vice president of the Wildlife Trust. Yolo couldn't join us tonight, unfortunately, but he did want to send all of us, including you at home, a little message. Hello there, it's Yola Williams here, and I'm really sorry I can't be with you this evening, but I wanted to share a few thoughts on the River Wye. Um, it's a river that I've known really well from the late 1970s onwards. I've walked the river several times from source to sea during the 1980s and early 1990s whilst working for the RSPB, undertaking surveys of riparian birds, especially goose anders. And it's one that I remember with fondness. I filmed all along the river as well. All kinds of wildlife from goosanders to kingfishers to eels to salmon to trout to native white clawed crayfish. But it's a river that's in trouble. And I've got to be honest, I don't actually enjoy walking the River Wye anymore. When I walk there now where once I saw a river clean and full of wildlife, full of fish, uh, full of otters, herons, gooseanders, kingfishers, dippers. I see a river that's struggling, not just because of the loss of habitats along its banks and forestry and modern intensive agriculture, but more than anything, it's because of a uh, huge mushrooming of intensive poultry units. I think I'm right in saying that I don't think Powys has ever turned a single intensive poultry unit down. We've become the poultry unit capital of the world and it's absolutely disgraceful when you look at the mess of our rivers and something really needs to be done. Powys needs to get a grip on itself. I think the Welsh government needs to get a grip on itself and the UK government maybe needs to step in as well and take action here because it, it, it's an absolute disgrace. So I hope this is the beginning of the fight back where we get back what was once, without a shadow of a doubt, one of the best, one of the cleanest rivers in the whole of the UK. Thank you for listening. Diolch Well, thank you, Yolo Williams, for sending that message for us tonight. And thanks for everything you do as Vice President of the Wildlife Trusts. So, as I said earlier, delighted that we're also being joined tonight by the legendary Fergal Sharkey. Uh, Fergal, I don't want to sort of embarrass you too much, but if I'd gone back in time and told myself as a teenager I'd be chatting to you uh, one day, I, would have, I wouldn't have been able to believe it at all. So it's just fantastic. But I wouldn't have necessarily guessed it would be about this issue. Uh, to kick us off, Fergal, just tell us how you first got involved in campaigning around river pollution. quirks my life has taken where until quite recently random people would stop me in the street and want to talk about music and the impact it had on their lives in recent years people now want to talk to me about sewage and rivers clearly something badly happened I am chairman of the oldest fly fishing club in the country still fishing the same stretch of river a stretch of the river lee in Hertfordshire called the Amal Magna Fishery and we began to realize some 15, 20 years ago now, some issues impacted on the river regarding flow, water quality. When I became chairman, we began working quite closely with Fish Legal, who for those that don't know is a quite extraordinary, very small, but quite passionate, brilliant charity attached to the England Trust that works with fishing clubs, providing the legal 
and uh, statutory clout that's needed to hold people like the Environment Agency and National Resources Wales to account. We quite quickly settled our issues, but that left me with a kind of big question mark that if a little fishing club of 60 men and women had to go to the trouble of working with the charity, prepping a case for the High Court, pretty much ending up on the steps of the High Court, simply to force the Environment Agency to do the right thing, that made me curious, that gave me an itch, and rather stupidly I scratched that itch. And as I then discovered, there's a whole range of problems out there that we're becoming increasingly well aware of, that have been clouded for years, have been smokescreened for years in clouds of mediocrity and incompetence, and that finally now are being dragged, kicking and screaming into the sunlight. And the River Wye is just and the latest example. It's a litmus paper and indeed simply a proxy for what in reality has been going on with the broader environment throughout the United Kingdom. And so, Fergal, what's the range of problems you've seen in, in our rivers, how they've developed over time? Um, well, the simple things, the why is the, the classic example. You yourself have noted it not until quite recently in crystal clear waters is technically still one of the most strictly legally protected salmon rivers in the whole of Western Europe. It hits wave after wave of ranunculus, all of which is gone. All of the invertebrate life is crashing all of the insect life has fallen off a cliff edge, and the same can be said. I think for me, the most damning statistic of all is actually the Environment Agency's own data for England. We now know there is not a single river in England that meets good overall environmental health. Not a single river. That is just a scandal of international, if not global, proportions. It is absolutely extraordinary. So, I mean, who do you who do you blame in all this? I mean, do you blame those uh, public bodies, you know, Environment Agency, Natural England, for not doing their job? Do you blame governments for not funding them properly? Do you blame the water companies? Do you blame farmers? Do you blame consumers? Or all of the um, above? Well, listen, you have to start at the top in these equations. And it's quite clear on both sides in Wales and England. There has been a complete lack of political oversight for the last 30 years. Uh, when it comes to the regulators themselves, there's quite clearly been a massive case of regulatory failure. I can give you a pertinent example, if you bear with me for one second. As some of you may know, somewhat reluctantly in my opinion, the Environment Agency and Offwat have now actually opened an investigation file on five water companies in England and earlier today, the uh, EA put out a uh, interim update statement, and I just want to read one sentence of it, if I might. To quote, our initial analysis of the information collected, the data has confirmed that there may have been widespread and serious non-compliance with the relevant regulations. This is the Environment Agency, the statutory body charged with regulating the environmental impact of the water industry after 30 years owning up that it looks like there has been widespread and serious non-compliance with the relevant regulations. Begs the question, what the hell was the Environment Agency and off what doing for the last 30 years? Absolutely right. And so, Fergal, what would you say? What do you think is the most important thing for us to really be trying to do now to turn this around uh, on the River Why or on any of these rivers? What would, you, what would you say needs to be the focus of campaigners right now? Um, well, if I might, and I'm, I'm going to say this as, as de delicately as I can, uh, we are entering an incredibly crucial phase in all of this. And I normally don't be, like being political, but I'm going to be political. Where we are right now is a very dangerous time with the current administration of the United Kingdom. We are clearly on a path to deregulate as much as possible, to sweep aside any of the existing and particularly international, like the Habitat Directive. For those that were watching the uh, bill that was published yesterday, the levelling up bill clearly includes a new idea of environment output uh, regulations which will allow the Secretary of State to sweep aside, undermine, and basically revoke 
all current environment legislation. The truth is, we know the government's targets for the environment bill are nonsense, to be perfectly honest. We know the government is intent in further deregulation. The bonfire that Quangos was announced last week, and I suspect if the env environment lobby really wants to do something really strategic and important, it is going to have to acknowledge its own shortcomings and have to acknowledge that the job now has to escalate, that it needs to come together, that it needs to start bringing in external help, support and influence, and needs to start upskilling and really, really beginning to develop a very strategic, very political and very planned approach to what it wants to achieve over the next five to 10 years. In short, Craig, I was very taken with James earlier on. Here's what's going on. We in the environment lobby talk about restoration spaces, climate change. Others talk about making as much money as they possibly can as quickly as possible. We talk about river restoration and natural recovery. They talk about making as much money as they possibly can as quickly as possible. We talk about collaboration and partnership. They talk about making as much money as they possibly can as quickly as possible. The impact is seen in the price of chicken and everything Sarah has to deal with. The impact is on the damage the water industry is doing to our rivers and the environment. The damage is on what agriculture is doing to the environment and to our rivers. And between those two agendas alone, agriculture and water industry, we're looking at 60, 70% of all of the pollution impact in our rivers. We talk about collaboration. Their drivers and their masters talk about making as much money as they can as quickly as possible. We have to disrupt that dynamic. Okay, thank you, Fergal. I think you've certainly woken everyone up in just the way that we wanted there. <laughs> and it's worth saying, it's worth saying, remember that of course, uh, after the 2016 EU referendum, uh, the government promised to maintain and enhance environmental protections as we Brexit. And uh, that promise was given by Theresa May when she was Prime Minister, uh, Michael Gove when he was Secretary of State for the Environment, and then also Boris Johnson when he became uh, Prime Minister. And at the Wildlife Trust, we will continue to try and hold the government to account to deliver on that promise. But we are very concerned at some of the talk around deregulation, around environmental protections at the moment. Craig, let me just pick you up on that very point. Whilst the government was making that statement, I now am aware that in 2015, the British government, along with some others, began trying to find a way to undermine and bypass the impact of the Water Framework Directive. As you will all recall, the objective was that at the very latest, by 2027, 100% of waterways in the United Kingdom would reach good overall environmental health. Yet I now know that the British government and others began meeting in 2015. And I am quoting from some minutes I have to find a way out of that 2027 deadline. That process has led to what we now know is the 25 year plan for the environment. And that 100% of rivers by 2027 has now become 75% in natural state, whatever that means, there's no definition as soon as is practicable. So whilst the Prime Minister was telling that, people behind the scenes were delivering a whole other agenda. So uh, we've had lots of comments coming in. Uh, Simon Browning has pointed out for the last 12 years, water companies have been in charge of monitoring their own discharges. Uh, Papa Smurf says, YOLO says it like it is. Brilliant stuff. And by the way, Shiny Warm has also said, Fergal is excellent. We need people in wildlife trust to speak bluntly about politics like Fergal. Charities have a few issues around that sometimes, but anyway, uh, but absolutely right. We do want to tell the truth about what's happening uh, to the environment, what needs to be done to sort it out, absolutely for sure. Rob Stoneman has said, really rather heartening to hear Sarah uh, talk about chicken manure as a wasted product. Equally, it is interesting the Dutch government does not allow this chicken manure to be spread on the land. Now, you know, with Wild Lives, we like to have a poll and find out what you think. And so the first poll will be coming up very shortly. Um, and the question we want to ask you, the first one tonight, very simply, 
Would you swim in our rivers in their current state? Yes or no? Would you swim in our rivers in their current state? And uh, that poll should be appearing soon and would love to hear what you think about this. The River Y, right outside here, this cafe where we are tonight, uh, is considered to be a bathing river. And we did see uh, people swimming in it earlier today, but it certainly uh, caused a lot of concern for people's health uh, over the last few years as people do swim in, in the River Y. So we'd love to know what you think about that. The first question we've had from you, well, actually not the first question, but one of the first questions I want to put to the panel tonight Great one from Tony Fagan. Tony said, what is the most urgent action that could be taken now to begin the journey of river restoration? The most urgent action. Sorry, James, I'm going to come to you. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I think we basically need a cessation on development um, and because we need to lower the inputs into the catchment and then we need that to use that to buy time to formulate a new governance structure and a new funding structure. And I think, you know, that there's a model called the Nature Investment Cooperative, whereby, you know, you pull together all sectors, you know, farmers, businesses, um, government and NGOs, and you pull private and public funding. And then through an independent chair, you look at the whole catchment and you model where problems are, you know, using the refocused data, using the data from NRW and the citizen science, and then that directs where you put your wetlands, where you put your buffers, where you put your riparian woodlands. We need to get to that stage where we're actually starting to deliver the solutions because everybody knows that there's a problem on the Y and we basically know where those problems come from. Let's start moving to the solutions now. Absolutely. Sarah, what would you say? What's the first thing, the urgent thing that needs to be done? Education of ignorance. <laughs> I, every, in every industry, you get good and bad practice. And I think farming is such a generational industry that if you've always done something on a certain field at a certain time of year, the generation carry that through with a lack of education of actually perhaps that's not best practice for what we're talking about tonight with actually stopping things ending up in the river. So I think education is going to be a huge part of the solution for our industry. And I'm probably going to get shot for saying that. But I think education of farming methods, I mean, we've changed, but sometimes family farms don't catch up with actually the new ways of doing things and actually the damage that could be getting done. So I think, yeah, education is huge on this journey. Nicola, what do you consider the most urgent action? Well, we do need to dramatically reduce the amount of manure being spread to land in this catchment, dramatically. I mean, the refocus data said it's, eight, it's the equivalent of reducing 80% of the poultry manure plus 50% of the cattle manure plus all of the fertiliser. So that's a lot. That's, that's the scale of change needed. So I think as well as a moratorium um, on new developments, we actually need to be trying to de-scale some of the ones that exist as well as look at technological solutions. I think that means consumers need to cut back actually on some of these products and, and ask the supermarkets to do a hell of a lot more to pay for the damage that they're causing. And that all comes down to saying pollution cannot be profitable, and it is. So we need enforcement, like dramatic enforcement from the regulatory agencies to punish bad practice um, from the water companies, as well as um, when there is kind of bad farming practice where you know, huge manure piles are put next to a river, the kind of really egregious examples need to be punished. Otherwise, there's no incentive for farmers to do the right thing. Very, uh, very interesting, Nicola. But I was particularly interested in Sarah giving me some affirmative ums there, uh, as you were saying, that around holding back on, on development of new sheds, well, it's essentially. Not, it's not the new developments. I think it does come down to educating people on how their farm is being managed. Very few actually soil test. Very few will test that manure before they put it on. Nobody ever rings their fertilizer supplier and says, oh, I'll have you know, 20 tonne of whatever you've got sat on the yard. It's down to a real scientific preciseness of what you're paying for that product. And yet people do utilize poultry manure because it's rocket fuel without actually understanding what they're putting on the ground or testing that soil to see what was actually needed. So I think they can no longer do an uneducated spreading of manure. I think it needs to be utilized properly. And that comes down to education rather than enforcement in my mind, because we're at the end of every chain of getting a kick in, to be quite honest. 
we're always the one that ends up with less money at the end of the day. We don't get cost of production for a lot of products that are on your supermarket shelves. And that's not just a meat and egg and poultry. That's in the vegetable sector and the horticulture sector as well. So it's across the industry. We are pinched at every point because we're at the bottom of the supply chain. Um, so I think it is very much education and understanding, actually, that NRW in Wales should be on farm, educating and advising rather than turning up with a fine or the last sort of resort because that's why I'm probably the only farmer you're going to get to talk to about this because we're so frightened the fear of being penalized for saying actually I've got a little bit of problem I could do with some advice that is not an option at the moment because of the attitude that we have to penalize them for doing it and I get it that I understand why that is the attitude but I think actually if there was a point where a farmer could ring up NRW and say I know I've got a problem I need somebody to come out and advise me please can you do that that's not going to happen we're not in a situation that that can happen because there's no trust between the regulatory bodies and the farmers and nobody wants to put their head above the parapet to actually have it chopped off and, and put you out of business because we're not making tons of money our beef and sheep is running on a loss so we yeah it's a struggle to make a living in this industry properly at our scale i can't talk for everybody but we really do struggle there is a real problem around cheap food isn't there well, you know the public, I think there's such a disconnect from actually, we've said agriculture a lot tonight, we've said farmers a lot tonight, we produce every piece of food on your supermarket shelf. Milk does not come from a carton, it comes from a cow that has been milked. You know, these things are produced on farms, so it's not just agriculture, it's not just farmers, we produce food, affordable for the consumer. It's all subsidised to make cheap food. And that's been, that's been the way it's been since the war. So everybody could come out of rationing and actually have a decent diet so that we weren't malnutritioned and things. So it's, yeah, there's a huge circular problem here of supermarkets pushing consumers and expecting everything yesterday. And the farmer is getting left behind a little bit with that. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I do want to just come back to this issue about uh, new developments because, James, you were telling me earlier today something astonishing that how... A lot of these new chicken sheds, these intensive poultry units, don't even require planning permission. Tell me more about that. Yeah, so there's an environmental permit threshold, which for poultry is 40,000 birds. So until you go above that, you don't have to produce um, a full sort of manure management plan that deals with the um, habitat um, directive regulations. Um, you can basically just apply for an agricultural shed and say it's going to house livestock. Um, so, I mean, you know, we've seen a huge growth of those lower level units within um, the catchment, especially in the early years of development. And um, we got to the point where really when no one was considering cumulative impact, which they should have been um, uh, under the, the, the SAC designations. And, <clears throat> you know, I think really there were no official numbers on um, the level of poultry within the catchment. You know, there's been a huge amount of work done by voluntary organisations like... Um, the um, um, CPRW, and they're estimating that there's between 10 to 20 million birds just within the catchment. 20 million in the wild yeah, catchment, yeah. definitely 20 million at least. Quite extraordinary. And I, I do find it rather extraordinary that the, um, the essentially you're saying these intensive poultry units can be built under what is technically known as permitted development, isn't it, essentially? Yeah. So there's very little scrutiny required of them. The assumption is that they can go ahead unless there's a very good reason to. And, uh, you know, what I find interesting is when I put solar panels, 13 solar panels on my roof at home about six years ago, because it was a flat roof and I was putting them on risers, I had to get planning permission for 13 solar panels to go on my roof at home, but not for an intensive pulse unit. I think that needs uh, something to think about. Um, Fergal, um, let me put to you that question from Tony Fagan. What is the most urgent action that could be taken now to begin the journey of river restoration? Where would you start? Uh, I think you have to take a step backwards. The real vacuum right now is political leadership. You deal with the political leadership or lack of it. You then start addressing the issues that Sarah's been referring to. The three pound chicken in a supermarket shelf. How does anybody actually ever think that ever gets there? from a supply chain and a farmer and all of the costs involved in looking after it and feeding it and transportation or indeed cheap water. So the simple truth is right now, we have no political leadership either side of the border in the case of the River Wye. And yes, regulation can take a very straightforward form. And I say this as a former regulator. 
there is an opportunity to sit with industry and frequently happens in the modern world and agree a set of guidelines, disagree a set of guidance, mutually approved by all sides, and then those farmers and those in industry that need help, support and guidance can get it, and those that insist in not complying with the regulations get to discover that the regulator carries a very big stick. But that all of that takes political oversight and political leadership. And let's face it, as we all know, all of the regulations there, all of the legislations there, it's simply not been enforced and hasn't been enforced for a very long time. And the reason for that, political leadership and people not being prepared to tackle big decisions involving chickens for three pound in a supermarket and some of the cheapest water in Western Europe. Okay, thanks, Fergal. Uh, I, I want to come to another issue here. We've had a question from Prue Reynolds that said, would rewilding and change of structure and farming methods help? And uh, we also had a sort of similar or linked question. Is rebed filtration possible in a river system? So James, what is the, the role that could be played here in sort of creating new habitats uh, or indeed rewilding to actually reduce pressures on the catchment? Yeah, so what we're broadly talking about is what in the sector we'd call nature-based solutions. So we've heard earlier that the soils in the River Wye are quite poor at holding phosphate. Um, they're also prone to erosion, and that um, risk of erosion is going to increase as climate changes. You know, we get these storm surges, as we've said earlier. So, you know, we've got a bunch of targets, haven't we, for nature's recovery? You know, we as a wildlife just want to see 30% of the land managed for nature um, as its primary use and in good condition for nature by 2030. That can be achieved through wetlands, which is where you'd get your reed bed filtration. That can be achieved through buffering, so effectively taking um, 6 to 10, maybe even 15, 20 metres out of production um, against the riverbank. That could be low-input grassland, could be um, restoration of the floodplain. You know, a shocking amount of river channels are disconnected from their floodplain. That's causing a whole bunch of other problems that's picked up elsewhere. You know, you've got this massive disconnect, haven't you, between the price of that food and then the externality cost of that food. You know, and it, that goes back to Professor Dasgupta, doesn't it? And the fact that nature is, is not on the balance sheet. And yeah, you know, rewilding, that's quite controversial, but what, what would that mean? That could mean extensive grazing. That could mean um, an increase in the structure of scrub. Um, that could mean a shift in livestock to more traditional cattle breeds with a lower input. You know, that would all help protect um, and prevent the runoff of that embedded legacy nutrient getting into the river channel. I just want to say on that, Helen Stace from Herefordshire Wildlife Trust made a really interesting point where she said if all of the millions of pounds that have been spent on farming advice in this catchment had instead been spent buying up riparian land and <laughs> having really good river buffers throughout, we'd see a real improvement in water quality. And I just think that's such a powerful point that river buffers do deliver lots of benefits. They filtrate the pollution, but they also, and you know, absorb nutrient, but they also provide shade, which will help the rivers with climate change. They serve lots of purposes. So I think another urgent action should be, you know, serious investment in river buffers quickly to try and stem the flow of some of these nutrients. Sarah, talk to me about river buffers from a farming perspective. <laughs> I totally agree that it's necessary to have those. But you have to, it comes back to my point about education and regulatory bodies being on farm, advising a farmer how to best do that and still allow that farm to be financially viable and still produce the quantity of food with a growing population that is going to be demanded. Um, so I do agree. And we've looked at it when we put um, planning in, which took us two years to have, James, by the way, I didn't sneak it in. Um, I think it's, it's part of the process that should have been in place when the planning permissions were asked for. And I think some of the Paris County Council decisions um, in our area were more about visible, um, visual impact of a shed going up than the actual impact of perhaps runoff off the range. They've made them put them in the Bark Valley bottom instead mm -hmm. of allowing them to go on the, you know, a little bit further up. So it was a bit more visible, but actually a lot better from an environmental point of view. Education, have an advisor come on and say, if you did this, this and this, you would help things greatly. And I think that's where the money needs to be spent. And obviously, you know, that, that issue about that we need the agricultural policy in, in England and in Wales to actually reward farmers for doing the right thing rather than 
necessarily doing the things that will, will harm the environment. We, we've seen those introduction of environmental land management policies in England now, although we at the Wildlife Trust feel they could be a lot more ambitious than they currently are. Welsh Government is, is bringing about an agriculture transition. It's, it's going to take a little bit longer. Some of the indications are it might be better, might be worse. It's hard to, you know, we don't know yet. That's a whole different discussion in its own right. But uh, it's not quite there yet. But ultimately, this, this sort of promise that has been made that public money should be used to help farmers deliver public goods, has not come through yet, has it? Not yet, and it would be really useful if anybody has a crystal ball out there to tell us what's coming so that we can plan our businesses to be able to adapt to that. But I think inevitably, I personally do not agree with funding coming from elsewhere. We should be running a business that's financially viable to invest in those changes ourselves. Um, I've always said you could never take a farming structure into Dragon's Den and say, right, I'm going to work all these hours, it's going to cost me all this money, and then I'm not going to ensure what I'm going to get paid for my product at the end of it, because that is the situation we're in. If I knew what the price was going to be that I was going to get for my product constantly, I could allot investment, and I could actually look at doing what needs to be done without government funding. That's me personally. My business wouldn't survive without the grants that we get currently. So there is that vicious circle of needing funding from externally of the business to do this, and the regulations and things are not always done in the most mindful way of actually helping us all achieve. Because I actually think we all want to achieve the same thing. Nobody purposely damages their environment they live in. You know, farms are where we live, so we're not doing it on purpose. So, um... Now, we do try and avoid uh, too much jargon when we're doing wild lives, but uh, just to ha highlight a few that you've heard tonight, if you heard about Professor Das Gupta, James was talking about, he did the Das Gupta Review, on the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity. And in case you want to know more about that, you can go back on our YouTube channel to a wildlife, special wildlife, where I did a one-on-one -on -one interview with Professor Dasgupta uh, just last summer. So you can look at that there. Uh, if you want to know more about the agricultural transition that's going on across the UK, you can also look at the wildlife we had on that in December 2020, I think, in which Minette Batters from the NFU and others joined us for discussion about, and also uh, advisors from DEFRA as well, from the Department of Environment, uh, Farming and Rural Affairs, uh, who took, came together to talk about what's needed from that agricultural transition. So there's a lot more on the YouTube channel, Previous Wild Lives, that you can catch up and watch if you want to know more about those. Now, um, we asked you a poll uh, previously, would you swim in our rivers in their current state? Yes or no? Guess what? 85% of you said no. 15% of you said yes. Those with thicker skins, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> but 85% uh, of you said no. And that's a real shame, isn't it? Wouldn't it be nice to get to that? We should have a vision where 100% of us think it's safe to swim in our rivers. What would be so wrong about that? Fergal, uh, we've been, you've been talking a lot about how we've got to cut the pollution going into rivers and, and everything that James was saying about rewilding and restoring our riparian zones and so on is not instead of cutting the pollution coming at source, uh, it's as well as. Uh, in the work that you've done, in the campaigning work you've done, uh, did some of those sort of comments from James resonate with you, particularly that whole kind of the tragedy about how many rivers are not actually connected uh, to their floodplains? Uh, listen to all of it and uh, just picking up quickly on your poll I might remind everyone that uh, when Sir James Bevan the chief executive of the Environment Agency was asked about swimming in rivers in England his response was that he would be cautious about swimming in any river in England and that from the man running the very government agency charged with protecting them. James I think is right listen there's no one silver bullet to any of this it's quite clear, and it's used as an excuse, actually, that our rivers have, particularly over the last 50, 60 years, become disconnected from their natural surroundings. Floodplains, marshes were drained. I think 40% of the marshland around the River Thames was drained. The point that Sarah's making, all of it converted over to some sort of agricultural production. We needed to feed a nation after the Second World War. So it's not that any one of these is a silver bullet in itself. They're all reasonably relevant, but I also get concerned that they possibly miss the big point. 
Rivers are actually really simple beasts. They just need a reasonably plentiful supply of clean water and then let Mother Nature get on with the rest of it. Now, I'm happy to have a discussion about what we need to do, and I suspect many of those things will all play a role. But please do not lose sight that all the river actually wants is a plentiful supply of clean water. Is that too much to ask? Indeed, and I'd add to that, Fergal, that would it be novel to think of our wetlands as wet? And far too many of our wetlands are not <laughs> wet at the moment. And we need to do something about that as well. And that means reducing how much water we take out of the landscape and actually holding water back in our landscape as well. Yeah. And uh, so important to do that. And of course, there's lots of ways that can be done, not least beavers. And you'll remember, we also had a previous wildlife all about <laughs> beavers. Anyway, I always have to get that into every wildlife. Um, I'm going to give you another poll now to think about. Coming up soon, who most needs to invest more in improving our rivers? Government, you've got a choice of government, that's regulation, monitoring, enforcement, or water companies, reducing pollution and abstraction. So uh, have a look at that poll, and we want to know who, needs, who most needs to invest more in improving our rivers. We'd love to know what you think there. Um, the next question I just want to get to, a really interesting one, came in from Karen Nicholas. Can the damage to our rivers be reversed? And how long will it take? James, I'll come to you again, I'm afraid, to kick us off on that one. Right. So, yeah, I mean, I've maintained that the why is a solvable problem. I mean, it's down to the will and the funding. But we know the solutions. You've just got to make sure that everybody is brought together, told why, and then, you know, have the how explained to them. And that needs to be funded one way or another through either private or public funds. And, you know, some of that private funding could be through the supply chain. You know, there is an onus on the, you know, the, the controlling bodies, as, as um, Fergal referred to earlier, you know, companies like Avara, some of the biggest corporations in the history of, you know, humanity, they need to be funding these 100 million pound solutions. Because really, if they want a sustainable food supply, a sustainable water supply. I mean, we don't talk about water security an awful lot, but we're going to have to. You know, that is coming, and Mid Wales is going to play a really important role in retaining water for the future because the Y has drinking water abstracted from it and a large amount of water for crops, you know, potatoes, raspberries, strawberries. You know, we, we need that to be there, available and clean. Fergal, do you believe the damage to our rivers can be reversed, uh, or is this just trying to reduce more harm? Um, no, I can tell you from personal experience at the Animal Magna, you give a river what it wants, a reasonable supply of clean water, and Mother Nature is the most remarkably healing force that you could possibly ever imagine. Um, and it goes back for me, it can be achieved. We just need to start giving nature what it needs. In terms of water security, it, ironically enough, I think James is very right and picked up a very salient point. As we speak, London and the southeast of England is now one of nine cities in the world most likely to run out of drinking water. Again, because of that historical lack of political oversight, failure of regulation, and the water industry game in the system. We now have a situation where London is on a list, along with the likes of Cape Town, Jakarta, Sao Paulo, Mexico City, is running out of water. And the projection, I think, is now 1.3 trillion litres of water a day by 2050. So the truth is, the whole thing needs massive upscaling and investment. Ultimately, somebody's going to have to pay for it all. And I suspect, simply to secure London's water supply alone, people were going to have to pay for that in their water bills or through central taxation. There is a big mess coming down the road. Do you think, Nicola, it's something that can be reversed? Can you see this getting better? I really hope so. I'm, I'm with Fergal in that I think, yeah, Mother Nature is the great healer. And what, what rewilding projects have shown is when you do step back and, and stop polluting, things can recover really remarkably. But I'm not an ecologist, and I am very worried about the loss of ranunculus, the water crowfoot, that is the, the keystone of this ecosystem on the Y and has been knocked out of other rivers too, that you know, people that have got more expertise than me are saying if you lose the keystone habitats and you've lost the habitat that other creatures live in and feed on,
then you're going to you're going to lose everything up that chain and i don't know how you get that back but i'm not an ecologist i still hope that if you clean up the pollution you can you can bring life back but my understanding is we are maybe only a couple of years away of losing that whole ecosystem chain here so we are talking about radical action now if we want to turn it around sarah what's your sense of this i mean can we just make things a little bit better or a lot better i think well to hope a lot better and i completely agree with what nicholas just said i'm no expert but we do need to do something. We, and I think agriculture has been part of the problem and absolutely needs to be part of the solution. And I think that comes down to actually looking at us as individual farms and what we can do. But the education programme, like I said before, I know I keep harping on about it, but it really does come back to actually telling people how they can improve what they're doing. Great. Thank you, Sarah, Great. very much. Craig, Fergal, was could, that a comment? Yeah. Yeah, if I could just pick up for Nicola, and perhaps this is for everyone listening in, Ranunculus actually is a brilliant key indicator species. It's particularly fussy about the velocity of the water, i.e. the volume of water and the quality of that water. As I referred to the uninitiated, Ranunculus for an invertebrate is a five-star resort hotel with a three-star Michelin restaurant attached. <laughs> if you lose your Ranunculus, you've got an issue with water quality or water velocity, the volume of it and you need to start asking questions. And the fact the way is losing its ranunculus should set alarm bells ringing all the way from Cardiff to Whitehall. Yeah, uh, that's a beautiful description, Fergal. And that is the point, isn't it? What ranunculus does and other, what are called aquatic macrophytes, what they do is they can slow the water in, in the immediate vicinity of the plant and create these kind of little micro habitats for invertebrates and others. Uh, amazing plants when you see a really healthy river system uh, and, and how it kind of works. We've got some fantastic comments coming in here. Claire Muir has said, I was part of the 15%. Well done, Claire. I love <laughs> canoeing in the Y and really would not want to give it up. I am stubborn, but I try not to immerse myself, she says. And um, uh, Bill Laws has said, having taken my coracle, that's a bit brave, Bill. I know coracles are not easy to, to steer, are they? Having taken my coracle on the Y, at Hereford yesterday and seen the state of the river bottom. I'd avoid a dip, it looks disgusting. <laughs> uh, H Plant has said abstraction does need to be part of the holistic discussion, water quality and quantity. And of course, that's the thing. When you have uh, lower flow in the rivers, actually that concentrates the pollution even more and makes it even more uh, pr problematic. Uh, Signal R53 has said, uh, 532, I should say. Utility sewage treatment infrastructure is massively overwhelmed by a huge increase in sewage flows. Thames Water is making billions of profit, yet the rain comes and the sewage goes straight into the river. Again, really important to think about climate change here. If climate change causes more extreme flows, that means those storm overflows are going to be overwhelmed even more, and we're going to see even more sewage going into our rivers unless that gets sorted. So, so much to think about there. Um, I had another uh, question here that I wanted to come back to. Uh, hang on. There's just so many coming in. It's kind of hard to keep up. Um, but particularly, you know, there was one. Uh, here we are. Yes. Uh, it was who, how can we hold people to account for the damage that's being caused? There was one. I've got to find the question who the name came from. But it was a question about... Actually, how can we hold people to account that are causing the pollution in the first place? And how do we actually do it in such a way that it stops that pollution happening in the first place? Nicola. Well, I mean, so on, on the agricultural side, there was the farming rules for water introduced about four years ago. Um, four years, we've had hundreds of breaches recorded every year. And I asked the Environment Agency a few weeks ago how many pun you know, penalties have been given out. And they said one formal caution in the whole of England one formal caution. So you can have legislation, but if there's so little enforcement, there really is no deterrent for the bad actors to get better. And so the farmers that are doing the right things, you know, we're doing that out of the goodness of their hearts. They're not necessarily being rewarded for it, but they see the people behaving badly and go, oh, well, he's not being caught. So, you know, why am I making such a big effort? It's so toxic. Um, but my understanding from speaking to people at the Environment Agency is that you know, the farming rules for water is still the government and DEFRA really push it as an advice-led legislation. It's all about, there's a real cultural aversion in this country to punishing farmers, I think because farmers have a really hard life. As Sarah's made really clear, 
they're struggling, and so there's a natural aversion to punishing them. But I think good farmers want bad farmers to be punished. Is that right, Sarah? Do good farmers want bad farmers to be punished? <laughs> <laughs> yes and no. I'd say, yeah, best practice should always be the driving force of how a business works. A more, a more efficient business is better run and, and doesn't do these breaches. But I think um, it's a fine balance between actually UK food production, following the right rules. The rules change a lot for our industry. We are, from the poultry side, we are monitored massively um, from regulations of how many birds are allowed in and where we do every, what we do with everything um, and food security. Um, but I think from the waste product point of view, it does come down to actually finding ways to utilise it. And yes, if there was more options on the table for farmers, they would have places to put this stuff instead of putting it in inappropriate places or thinking they can use it on land they haven't actually tested. So I think from I'm not going to be as blunt to say, yes, as a good farmer, I'd want to see bad ones. But I do <laughs> think there does need to be some sort of either serious help that goes into these bad practice to actually say if you don't like on an individual basis because it's only a small handful that are actually doing really bad practice actually go in and give them a chance to fix it and then if they don't then it is absolutely necessary to make sure that they don't continue to do what they're doing the point, the point is the legislation is there it needs enforced mm -hmm. and it, it can only be enforced if the statutory agencies are funded properly you know there's a number of campaigns that are calling for the environment agencies and natural resources as well as budgets to be restored to 2010 and 2013 levels respectively immediately and then increased over the next five years as we move through the agricultural transition you need boots on the ground you know sarah's made that clear we're starting to see you know a tying up of the points now and you know let's refer back to fergal's comments about this all relies on top-down leadership and the political will because it can be done if you know people want to make it happen Fergal, go on then. I imagine you're going to have really, really good fun with this one. How do we make sure we hold the polluters to account? Um, well, listen, the, the, the reality is what's driving all, both sides of this conversation, both the water industry and farming, is political decisions about the price of the food on our tables and the price of the water coming out of our taps. And no politician, and this goes back decades, no politician wants to be responsible for the man or woman responsible for putting up the price of a carrot on your dinner plate or indeed the price of the water coming out of your tap. The world is now unfortunately changing and we are actually philosophically faced with the decision about a society, are we prepared to allow our environment around us to disintegrate to oblivion, which it's now in the process of doing. Or are we going to have to find a way to manage our own economy and the economics of our economy better and ensure that people like Sarah can actually make a decent living for a decent day's work? In terms of the water industry, it turns out the water companies have actually been given all the funding they needed for the last 30 years. As it turns out, every single year, the water companies have to certify to off what that they have the funding available, they have the resource available, they have the management systems, the people, the expertise, the plan to manage their sewers and ensure that they do not dump sewage into our rivers outside exceptional situations. So they've had the money, the companies know that, the question becomes, what happened to money? The question becomes, why in God's name haven't the EA and off what been enforcing the legislation for the last 30 years? Questions to be answered. Okay, I should say, thank you, Fergal. I should say Environment Agency, I think, would argue that they've not had the resources to do the enforcement properly. That would be their uh, answer to some of that. Uh, and let there's let all, also... Go on, Fergal. I'm just trying to put the other point of view. <laughs> Greg, listen, I get it. And by the way, has the environment... Just to clarify this... When we talk about the agency, I talk about the institution. And I want to be very, very clear about this. Every time I personally run into someone from the environment agency standing in a river wearing a wetsuit, without exception, they're incredibly decent people trying to do an incredibly decent job. Has the environment agency's budget been cut over the last 10 years? Yes. Does the board and the senior management team of the EA have to take as much responsibility for that as government? Yes, they do. We're talking about people being paid 
hundreds of thousands of pounds a year to run an organization and safeguard the 10 and a half thousand people that work for the EA, that they have the ability to go out there and do the job I know those people want to do. Personally speaking, I would not give the EA another penny until there's utter transformation of the board and senior management because simply putting the money back, you're going to leave the same inadequate, incompetent people running that organization. And I think the staff deserve much better than what they're currently being dealt with by senior management and the board. Okay, thanks, Fergal. I've now found who it was that asked this question. How could I have forgotten this name? It was Wild Monster uh, that asked, how, how can we bring to account those that are doing the pollution? So, Wild Monster, thanks very much for your question tonight. I, I said we'd ask you a poll. We had a poll. Who most needs to invest more in improving our rivers? Is it government uh, through regulation, monitoring enforcement, water companies in reducing pollution and abstraction, or indeed farmers, we also asked. And I think there's a lot of sympathy for farmers out there. You'd be pleased to know, Sarah. I mean, you know, I think, I think the audience would really want to see this pollution from farms stopped, but they recognise this is a system failure and a policy failure rather than blaming farmers as such. So 6% of people said uh, that they think it's, it's farmers that most need to invest more in improving our rivers. 6% uh, doesn't get you completely off the hook, but I think, I think you've made some strong points here tonight. And I think it's recognized there's a real system failure here and, and farmers need to be given a lot more support to be able to deal with these problems. Uh, water companies get 30%. 30% of you think it's water companies that most need to invest more in improving our rivers. And 63% of you think it's government. 63% of you think government needs to sort this out and invest more in trying to solve these problems and bring in more regulation, monitoring, and crucially, that word again, enforcement. Now, uh, I'm very sad to say we are really running it out of time here uh, in this Wild Live tonight. Uh, one of the things we have got is a live campaign on this uh, with Radnorshire Wildlife Trust, Herefordshire Wildlife Trust and others. And one of the things we want to invite you to do is take action tonight. And coming up on the YouTube chat soon will be a link to a petition that we really want to encourage you to sign. Uh, for what needs to happen to save the River Wye. So please, please, please do sign that petition. Get involved in this crucial campaign to help uh, end the damage to the River Wye and restore it. And sadly, we have only got a couple of minutes left. So I want to come around to this fantastic panel tonight and just ask them a simple but huge question. If you had a magic wand and you could wave that magic wand and make something happen in the next five years, what would it be? You could be delighted. Now I'm going to start with you. <laughs> um, I would take out 80% of the intensive livestock in the catchment. That's it. Thank you very much. Sarah, what about you? I hope I'm not in that 80%. <laughs> um, I purely put in the resource to put in the solution. It can be done. It's super simple. Let's burn it and let's create green energy and actually have a positive story coming off the back of the industry instead of a negative one. Fergal, what about you? To put in place a government that actually has the determination, the vision, the ambition, the ability, the desire to truly put policies, funding, strategies in place to not only safeguard but further enhance and develop the natural world around us. Because if we don't achieve that, we're going to lose all of it and much quicker than we could possibly ever imagine. And James, if you had a magic wand, what, what would happen in the next five years? So I'd make sure that 30% of the land within the catchment was managed primarily for nature. So you'd get those nature-based solutions in to protect their water, to mitigate against climate change, help with water security and alleviate and flooding. Excellent. Well, we've discussed so many uh, aspects of this issue tonight, and we've had hundreds and hundreds of you putting in your questions and comments tonight at this crucial discussion, yes, about the River Wye, but also what needs to happen more generally to solve the scandal of river pollution in this country. Clearly a really hot topic and one that you care so much about. Uh, I want to sort of say that you make sure you do follow the Wildlife Trust on our social media channels, on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, and also hit the subscribe button 
on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, to make sure that you follow all the videos coming out from the Wildlife Trusts, and also so that you know when the next wild lives are happening. We've got many more wild lives planned across the year, some really exciting ones, and we're going to be getting out onto location uh, much more uh, to really connect with people. We've even got some plans, some wild lives with a live audience for later in the year. You never know, so you might be able to get to those. We'll see how they kind of come together. Isn't it nice that we were able to think about that? So do make sure you follow our social media channels so that you know when they're happening and what they're about as well. Also, of course, don't forget to tell your friends of that. Try and get many more people involved and watching these wild lives. And do share them on social media after they've been out. Great that you've been watching live, but actually most of our views come from people after the event as well and from people who've watched it sharing it on social media and recommending it. So please make sure you do that as well. But I want to close tonight, of course, with a huge thank you to our brilliant panel that have discussed this hugely important issue tonight. And of course, our other participants and contributors for Helen Stace, Chief Exec of Herefordshire Wildlife Trust, to Professor Withers up at uh, Lancashire Uni uh, Lancaster University. Uh, also, of course, to Yolo Williams, uh, Vice President of the Wildlife Trust for their video contributions. And thanks very much to my panel here, Sarah James. Uh, you've done a fantastic job, I think, in really kind of putting the farming point of view. And we're really grateful that you did that. I think that was essential tonight. And thank you for the work you're doing in trying to help solve this problem. To Nicola as well, thank you so much for the work you're doing and for your brilliant insights tonight in this. And of course, for that Riverside documentary. As I said, riverside.tv. You can start watching it in a couple of minutes, um, not in the next minute. And uh, obviously also to James, James Hitchcock, Chief Executive of Randomshire Wildlife Trust. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. And also from London, uh, the legendary Fergal Sharkey. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and putting such brilliant points across as well. It's been a great discussion. I'm sorry we've run out of time, but lots of food for thought there. Let's get those rivers cleaned up. Let's get to that place where actually 100% of us do want to swim in our rivers. Thank you very much and good night. <laughs>